privileged to speak uh, under the name of Rosa Luxemburg, and we should remember, perhaps just in beginning, that exactly 100 years ago, Rosa Luxemburg was in prison in Germany for opposing the slaughter of the First World War, um, the imperialist slaughter. Anyway, to the talk. Um, there's been, for the last half century, there's been some progress, I think, in the development of Marxist theorizing on the state, but so, if there's been some progress, we're also left with a lot of problems. At stake in the debate is not just the question of what Mil Ralph Miliband called the state in capitalist society, but equally the question of what we mean by Marxism. <coughs> the debate about state theory really began, I suppose, or revived in the early 1970s. Um, and one place to begin is where the organisers asked me to begin, um, with the debate between Ralph Miliband and Nikos Poulantzas. Now, Miliband wrote a book which came out in 1969 called The State in Capitalist Society. And he took his key arguments from C. Wright Mills, who was his supervisor, um, and to whom the book is dedicated. And in other words, he took his key ideas from not so much from Marxism as from radical elite theory. And I'll try and explain what I mean. What he suggests in the book is that modern industrial societies are marked, as is fairly obvious to us today, by persistent inequalities between the owners of business and the working class. These, he documents at uh, some length. The ruling elite in society, says Miliband, is a cohesive group whose power rests on the fact that it possesses the greater part of private property, or property in society. It enjoys overwhelming influence on the state and on the political institutions of society generally. It enjoys predominant influence over the media, over the churches, over the law, over uh, education, and so on. And it, essentially, it, it has this overwhelming influence because of its unequal access to the positions of control within all those different inst institutions. The members of the ruling elite, as he shows for country after country, tend to go to the same schools, the same universities, they have the same privileged access to all spheres of social life, and they have essentially, in country after country, he says, succeeded in preserving the essence of capitalist private property. That's the heart of his argument. I hope I'm not misrepresenting him. Now, there are several problems I want to identify with this approach. The first is that Miliband uses a very conventional sociological account of class. Let's say what he means by class is that some individuals have more wealth than others. The fo his focus is on the distribution of things and money. Some people have a lot, some people don't have much. But his account of class is of a distribution of things and money, not of a relationship between classes. If you were to ask Miliband, unfortunately he's not around, he died in 1994, so I think, um, if you were to ask him, certainly when he published his book, what's the difference between capitalism and feudalism, he'd say, he'd have to say, in terms of the theory he presents, well, under capitalism, most of the wealth is in the form of money and factories and so on. In feudalism, most of it was in the form of fields and, uh, and farms. But that doesn't really give you any sense of the dynamics of feudalism as against the dynamics of capitalism. Capitalism is a different kind of system for other reasons than simply the inequality between rich and poor. That's one problem. The secondly, the working class, for somebody claiming to present a Marxist account, the working class plays no part whatever in the dynamics of capitalist society except as a suffering class of people who haven't got very much money. Um, it's the class that gets least and suffers most in his account, but he plays very little part in the constitution of society, 
It is politically socialized and it is ideologically subjected in every dimension, in the media, in the, in the law, in education, etc. Every, every account he gives of a different institutional area of society is one of domination from, by an elite. Now this is very odd, bearing in mind that his book came out in 1969 at the height of the student revolt. So his account of education has no account even of the possibility of a student revolt. And to Miliband's credit, it has to be said, he was teaching at the London School of Economics at the time, he did in fact support the students. But he hasn't given any reason in his book why the students might even revolt or that the possibility of student revolt exists. The third problem I want to identify with Miliband, and, and then we'll move on, is that he assumes for the sake of his argument, and it's central to his argument, that the ruling elite is a cohesive group that it sticks together, it's got a common vision of society, if you like, which it imposes on the rest of society. That's an es it's essential to his whole argument. This is a different view from that of Karl Marx. For Marx, the capitalist class, the bourgeoisie, is a divided class. It's a class split and asunder by competition. It is constantly at war with itself. Marx describes the capitalist class in the third volume of Capital, volume three, as a class of hostile brothers. They're always at war with each other. How does a class divided by competition form a consistent view of its own interests? That is a problem which Miliband doesn't address. I have to say in his defense, he did later modify his views, but I'm trying to present where he started and what started the debate. Later on, he was to start discussing the necessary autonomy of the state from the capitalist class. But in his first book, it doesn't appear. So there's, he starts, he sets up a set of problems for us, I think, which is quite useful to identify, because at least we can then begin to think, where are the questions about Marxism, the capitalism, and the state? Now, Polatius comes along, and he suggests that Miliband lacked what he called a theoretical problematic. And I think that's wrong. He did have a theoretical problematic, but it was drawn from elite theory. And Polantis, I'm going to say less about Polantis, partly because I'm deeply unsympathetic to his way of writing. Um, he's almost unreadable at times, in my view, but he offers us a theory based, initially anyway, on the ideas of Louis Althusser. And Althusser offered a very peculiar reading of Marx. Because what he sought to, to exclude from our understanding of Marx and Marxism was every trace of what he called humanism in Marx. Now, since Marx was a revolutionary humanist, I mean, we can discuss later whether I'm right about this, but it seems to me that one can't understand him in any other way. Um, well, so, attempting to take the humanism out of Marx and to develop a science of structures was, in any case, a very peculiar um, philosophical effort. And as some critics pointed out about the Althusser's own system, and one of those people was Nikos Poulantzis, by the way, um, one of the problems with it is that although it had some Marxist decorative labels attached to it, the structure of Althusser's system had a lot in common with the conservative structure the theory <coughs> predominant at that time in American social sociology of Talcott Parsons, the theory of structural functionalism. Onto this book, onto this theory taken over from Althusser and his colleagues, Poulins then attempted to map a theory of classes in his book, Political Power and Social Classes. Now, I have to say that Miliband did have one great advantage over Poulins's, and that is that Miliband was readable, whereas I find, Poulain, I must confine, say that I find Poulins's almost unreadable, and therefore I, I find it much more difficult to identify exactly what he's saying, to be sure even what he's saying at times. But I, it is important to note that he has something in common with Miliband in his theoretical project, which is that he doesn't begin with Marx's understanding of the social relations of production of capitalist society as being more than economic relations. He tends to assume that Marx was writing about economics. 
And I want to later on come back to that because it seems to me it should be criticized as an assumption. I think Marx was writing about politics when he wrote the three volumes of Capital, but we'll come back to that. Now, like Miliband also, Poulancis has nothing to say about popular movements. So he says that he's offering a relational theory of the state, but it's a relational theory of the state which is one-sided in that he makes reference in formal terms to the class struggle, but he doesn't explore it from the side of the active struggle of the working class. So you won't find him making, saying anything about May 68 in France, about the trade unions in France, their, their limitations or their, their, uh, their potential power, and so on. Now what's interesting, this debate goes on in the early 1970s. When you come to the later 1970s, Miliband and Poulancis basically come to, they don't, I don't mean they shake hands on anything, but they come, it turns out they both agreed with each other about something rather important. <laughs> they came to very similar political conclusions. Miliband, from the left of the Labour Party, he's, he always stood to the left of the Labour Party in, in Britain. Um, Poulancis, from the position of Eurocommunism, because he was a member of a, a, the Greek Eurocommunist uh, Communist Party, took positions which were not that dissimilar from those, and this is perhaps the, why there's a revived interest in them today. They took positions not so different from those of, say, some of the leading thinkers of the Pink Tide in Latin America, or indeed the thinkers of Syriza in Greece, the, the present leadership of the government in Greece. What they argue, <coughs> essentially, is that the state is open to class struggle. It is, in Poulantzis' phrase, a condensate of class, of class forces. The growth of parliamentary democracy in Europe and elsewhere, and of course it is something which has expanded its influence to more and more states in the 20th century, and particularly since the 1970s, makes the state partially available to change. And Miliband and Poulancis, in a sense, both in Miliband in a book called Part Marxism and Politics, and Poulancis in his last book, The State, uh, what's it called? The State, State Power and Socialism. In his last chapter, he presents an account in which, which is very like Miliband's, in which there, there's the possibility of left government, which clearly there is, and we see it in, in Greece today. Uh, but such governments will need help from social movements outside themselves. But then there is a degree of ambivalence amongst them, but on both Miliband's part and, and Poulancis's part, about exactly what the role of those movements is to be. The main action remains with the state. And one of the things that Poulancis stresses is that under all, all circumstances the state must avoid <coughs> generating, the left government must avoid generating economic crises, and otherwise society will simply fall apart. So the state is still necessary to hold society together, even with a left government, and there are limits to what a left government can do. Now this is not a very different formulation from, excuse me, from, from that put forward by, say, Karl Kautsky in the years before the First World War, in which he argued that it, the, the socialist movement should not destroy the state, but change it from within. And that that was essentially the, the, the means by which uh, capitalism might be transformed into socialism. So Poulancis and Miliband both stand on the ground, if you like, of left reformism. I think that's politically where they, where they stand, and it's quite use, important to, to place people politically in terms of the, the conclusions they draw, if we want to look at their analyses. Now, at the same time that the miliband Poulancis debate was going on, predominantly in the pages of New Left Review in Britain, there was another debate going on in Germany, which was also of great interest to Marxists, I think, sometimes known as the German state debate, or the state derivation debate, as it was sometimes called. <coughs> 
There's less clarity, I think, about the political conclusions that the people who participated in that took. Some of them have ended up, uh, for example, on the left of Die Linke in, in Germany today. Um, but what, what, the, what the German readers of Marx did was first, they, they really did go and read Marx very carefully. They read Capital and reread Capital, looking for answers to questions about politics. They tried to read Capital, not as a work of economics, but as a theorization of capitalism, as a system of social relations which is simultaneously a theorization of law and a theorization of politics and the state. And they attempted to answer a question which was posed, I think, perhaps most clearly by an old Russian theorist of law called Eugeny Pashukhanis in the 1920s. And Pashukhanis' question went like this. He started with Engels. You know, Engels famously wrote a book called The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. And he says, Engels treats the state as the product of class society. But he doesn't explain why it has the peculiar form it does under capitalism. And that's his question. Why does the state have the form it does under capitalism? Why is it that the state under capitalism doesn't appear like it does under feudalism or in slavery, in a society based on slavery, as simply the subordination of one section of society by, to, by another. Why does the state, and this is how <coughs> Pashukhanis put it, why does the modern capitalist state take the form of, quote, an impersonal mechanism of public authority, authority isolated from society? Now, as you're quite right, Engels didn't ask that question. Crash and Karnis wanted to answer that question, and the German comrades, we can call them, um, the theorists, Marxists, whatever, tried to explore that question. And they came up with different kinds of answers. I don't think any conclusion was reached by the German state debate. They posed some very interesting questions. I confess that I was more influenced in the 1970s by the discussions they were having than by the debate between Miliband and Polanski. So if you, if you want to understand what I'm saying, um, have a look at some of their work if you can. Um, some of them tried to explain beginning everything, beginning with Marx's opening chapters in Capital, the discussion of commodity production and commodity exchange. Others said, no, what really matters is capitalist exploitation, capitalist domination. That's the place where a Marxist theory of the capitalist state should begin. And one or two of them, particularly um, a woman who I think has now disappeared from Marxist politics, um, called Claudia von Braunhut, posed an additional question, which was a very important question, I think, which was why is it there are many states in capitalism, and uh, what exactly is the relationship between the capitalist state and the world economy? And I'll come back to that. But in any case, by the 19, end of the 1980s, sorry, by the end of the beginning of the 1980s, the whole debate against the state was dying away. Um, Nikos Boulansis himself committed suicide in 1979 in circumstances which I'd never fully understood. Um, Ralph Miliband eventually made his peace with an uneasy peace, it has to be said, with the Labour Party, but of course his sons, you will realise that Ralph Miliband is the father of Ed Miliband, the current leader of the Labour Party, and David Miliband, the, the last foreign, Labour Foreign Secretary, um, and an acolyte of Tony Blair. So you can see, certainly, everybody in Britain on the left believes that Ralph Miliband is, is revolving in his grave at the, what his sons have become. Uh, he certainly was far to the left of his sons. But the 1980s really see a decay of interest, not simply in the question of, of Marxism and the state, but in Marxism generally. Um, there are several reasons for this. One is the massive defeats that workers' movements experienced in a whole number of countries due to actually crushing defeats like the defeat of the miners' strike in Britain or of the fiat workers in Italy or the air traffic controllers in America, but also, of course, the rising level of unemployment, particularly the loss of manufacturing jobs in many countries. Secondly, the rise of identity politics. And thirdly, anyway, the confusion that the left was thrown into by the onset of the 
what we now call the neoliberal period, in, in which many people on the left who had previously been engaged in trying to develop a critique of state provision suddenly found themselves forced to engage in a defense of state provision against an onslaught from the right, the onslaught of privatization, and so on. I, I don't know anything about, the, about Slovenia, so I don't know whether that's a, an important issue here. I suspect it must be. Um, okay. So now is, it may be that now there is a revival in, in interest in Marxism and in the question of the state more generally. And if so, we have to understand that in terms of the impulses of the real world and real world struggles on our own thinking. We, don't, we never think uh, in isolation from what's going on in the world, it seems to me. Three things I think we should pay particular note of in terms of a revival of interest. The first is the growth of anti-capitalist movements across the world, and, not, and I'm including those increasingly the environmental movement and its concern about climate change. And people involved in those movements are looking, for, often find themselves asking, why are we involved in these struggles? And as soon as you start to ask why, you may find yourself beginning to be interested in Marxism because it does offer some sorts of question, answers to those sorts of questions, or at least attempt to do so. The second is the revival of anti-imperialism, particularly since 9-11 and the war in Iraq and so on. Again, poses all sorts of questions about the state and its relationship with capitalism. And thirdly, the economic crisis, of course, has posed questions for lots of people about the possibility of left alternatives to austerity and so on. Again, posing questions which, into which Marxists have perhaps offered answers and people have looked to them to offer answers. Okay, what then of Marx himself? In 19, 1859, really going back now. 1859, Marx wrote a famous preface to the Introduction to the Critique of Political Economy. Very few people ever read the Introduction to the Critique of Political Economy, but most people have some idea. They probably did look at the introduction, the preface. This is the one in which he says, he talks about his general framework of ideas, and people puzzle over it. Um, and one of the things he says in there is that his studies as a young man in the 1840s, led him to the conclusion that the forms of state, the forms of legal relations, were rooted in the material conditions of life, or what Hegel had called civil society. And the key to the anatomy of civil society was to be found in political economy. That's why he would started to study political economy. The conclusions he'd come to from his studies of law and the state. But he never says anything about what those studies had been about and what conclusions he'd reached in those studies. He doesn't mention it. There's a reason he doesn't mention it. It's the Prussian censor. Because if he'd said, and in those studies I declared that it was necessary to overthrow the entire system of bourgeois rule and the state, the censor wouldn't have let it pass. So he just said, in my studies of the state, I came to this general theoretical conclusion, you know, that the roots of the state are to be found in the study of civil society. But if we take the question of what he wrote in the 1840s seriously, in other words, if forget Althusser and ditching everything that Marx wrote uh, in, in his early, in his, in his splendid youth, um, when, when he was all your age, remember, um, if you look seriously at those early writings, what you see is Marx developing an extraordinary radical critique of the modern state. That's what those early writings are about. The, the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, on the Jewish question, uh, the King of Prussia and social reform, all texts written between 1843 and 1844. And all of them and are dealing with a question, and they are all dealing with a question about what has happened since the French Revolution, and what was Hegel writing about when writing about politics and law. And he treats Hegel not as some theorist of the past, 
but as the, theor the theorist, the, the acme theorist, if you like, of the constitutional state of modern society. He treats him as the most modern theorist, and he probes his ideas. And what he does is to argue Hegel had defended the modern state as being the epitome of, ration, of reason. What Marx does is to demolish that argument. Going through Hegel line by line, it's not the most exciting of documents, I must say, though Marx was enormously proud of it. He wrote it on his honeymoon, uh, apparently. Um, things people do on their honeymoons. Um, and um, he bashes away. Hegel defends the monarchy because it represents the principle of unity in society. Marx attacks the monarchy as the representative of biology in society because the monarchy is merely inherited by blood. He attacks the bureaucracy, which Hegel again treats as the epitome of rationality. He attacks it as the epitome of the separation of decision-making from ordinary people in society and making the state the property of a special group. He attacks parliamentary democracy, which is already, you know, in the sense of the representative assembly and so on, already present in the Prussian constitution uh, that when, when Hegel was writing. He attacks that on the ground that it is very undemocratic that people don't have any control over their representatives and so on, any more than you have control over your representatives in Slovenia today after you've elected them. Marx argues that changing the state, changing the government, changes nothing fundamentally. Um, society remains divided. Society remains ruled by the principles of private property, competition, modern political economy. The state can't solve social problems, he writes in uh, The King of Prussia and Social Reform. It can't solve problems like poverty. Um, indeed, the best thing that the state could do if it really wanted to help society would be to commit suicide. And then Marx remarks, unfortunately, suicide against, is against nature. And so he doesn't... So the, the state, he say, will not remove itself from the stage of history. It will have to be removed. It is an impediment to the advance of democracy, which is the value that he holds up above all as the value of human freedom. People should run their own society. That's his essential argument. What's needed is not simply political revolution, as in France in 1789. What is needed is social revolution. That's his conclusion. <clears throat> now, he doesn't much return to that question, because he essentially, I think it's because he saw it as essentially solved. He, apparently, according to his biographers, he carried around with him his copy, well, his only copy, because it was a handwritten manuscript. He was very proud of what he'd written about Hegel's, his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, and he continued to carry it around with him for the rest of his life. He did restate his principles in 1871, when the Paris Commune erupted. And what he said in 1871, was that he, he celebrated the Paris Commune, and in one of the drafts that he wrote of his final pamphlet, the civils, the, the class struggles in, in, no, sorry, what is it called? The Civil War in France. He wrote that the Paris Commune was a revolution against the state, and he celebrates it for that. He adds, the following year, he and Engels added to the many, the introduction to the manifesto for the, of the Communist Party when it was republished a sentence which said that the Commune proved that the working class cannot use the existing state in order to change society. And that's rather different from the positions of, let's say, Ralph Levin and Nicholas Poulancic. Engels told his readers some years later, if you want to understand the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, you should look at the Paris Commune. It's quite clear where they stood, and there's nothing to suggest that either Marx or Engels, anyway, ever changed their mind. When Marx died, Engels said beside his grave, Engel, Marx was a man of science, but above all, he was, in Engels' phrase, a revolutionist. So if you want to understand a Marxist theory of the state, <laughs> I would suggest we have to actually to think, well, what does it mean to hold a revolutionary theory of the state? Now, are there any problems with this position? There are lots. 
It's not that they're wrong, but it's that they're underdeveloped in a number of respects, in relation to the understanding of capitalism, I think. Now, in that, I referred to Marx's preface of 1859. And in that, he suggested that he was going to write six books, um, of which the, what he was offering in 1859 was only the first chapter of the first book. And those books were going to be on capital, landed property, wage labor, the state, foreign trade, and the world market. There were going to be six books, six volumes of capital. And he wrote out several other scheme, schemas for his plans in the Grundrisse, which you can find in the Grundrisse. The very similar, along similar lines, a six volume plan, which he then never completed, clearly. We don't even have outlines. As far as I know, I mean, the, now the, uh, all sorts of scholars across Europe are working through Marx's every last note to the milkman, almost, um, to every last scrap that Marx ever wrote, every last notebook is being published in this huge thing called the Mega. Um, one day, perhaps, we will find out that Marx did somewhere on the back of a laundry list somewhere write an outline of, the, of what he was going to write on the theory of the state. But I don't think we know. We haven't got a clue what he, how he would have treated the question. What might have been included in the book on the state that he said was necessary? How might he have proceeded to develop such a book in terms of the whole way that we know he proceeded very carefully, systematically, developing one idea out of another and so on? Perhaps in the mid-19th century, when he was writing, the matter seemed less urgent. After all, there was a war between Germany and France in 1870, 1870, 1870. But you can't say that the 19th century saw Europe convulsed by war. Violence it seemed to be recessive, as it were, within the development of capitalism in lots of ways in the 19th century. By comparison with the 18th century, for example, which was a century of war after war. But when you come to the 20th century and the 21st century, then, of course, the question of the state, once again, becomes unavoidable. Um, we, this, the 20th and 21st centuries are the centuries of imperialist wars. They're also the centuries of enormous expansion of state involvement in the organization of social and economic life. And, of course, there are also the centuries in which we've seen a vast extension of parliamentary democracy. So questions about the relationship between the state and the development of capitalism have become much more urgent, in a sense, in the last hundred years, by comparison with Marx's own time. I suspect if, you know, if we could summon up the ghost of Marx and say, well, you know, if you were doing it again, Comrade, how might you do it? I'll probably pay a bit more attention to the state in my account of capitalism, he might have said. Perhaps not. Who knows? Um, but I'm going to anyway. Um, even though if he had limited himself to 19th century material, never mind the 20th century, if Marx had limited himself to 19th century materials, the book on the state that he talked about would have been a pretty substantial volume. Now, Marx, Marx begins capital. I don't, I'm assuming, but I'm going to assume that you know a little bit about Marx's capital. But if you don't, maybe I'll try and explain as I go along anyway. Marx begins capital, of course, not with the exploitation of workers. He doesn't get to that till, oh, chapter 7, 8, or 9 or something. He starts with the commodity. What is capitalism? He begins by saying it is a heap of commodities. Begin, it appears as a heap of commodities. And he then spends, oh, page after page, and some people say turgid page after turgid page, asking the question, what exactly is a commodity? He begins with the commodity. He begins with value. He begins with exchange. He begins with money, not with exploitation. And in the same way, I suspect, if he had gone back, if he got started a book on the state, he would have had to go back to the same starting point. Not immediately beginning with state domination and the rest of it, but with 
asking questions about the legal and political character of the relations of commodity production and exchange, of value, if you like. And he talks about these in very, very, um, in passing, in capital, in very interesting passages. <clears throat> At the end of chapter six of, of, of Capital, volume one, Marx moves us, finally, for he, having discussed value and then develop the, abstractly at least, the concept of surplus value. He asks, how the hell is surplus value produced? And he says, it can't be produced inside the market, in, in the relationships of exchange. We have to go somewhere else to find it. And he takes us from the market, through the gate, into it's a fabulous piece of writing, apart from a great piece of literature. And he says, we're leaving the market. And what are the rules of the market, he says, they are liberty, equality, property, and Bentham. Never mind property and Bentham. Private property is obviously part of it, and Bentham is the principle that every man should look after his own interests. But liberty and equality, he says, are principles of market society, of the exchange of commodities. People have to be free, not slaves. They must be free in a certain sense, and equal in a certain sense, to participate in the everyday procedures of exchange. In other words, liberal values are rooted in the principles of the market. When we, when we leave the market, he says, we go into another place. And we'll see, we see a change in the people going through the gate. The man who came to buy labor power in the market, he says, marches ahead looking extremely smug as a capitalist. And the one who sold his labor power shrinks behind like one who's, who is taking his hide to market and has nothing to expect but a hiding, he says. And what do we find inside the factory, according to Marx? A political regime that he calls despotism. Where did he get this term from? Politics. The politics of Asiatic empires. That's what exists inside the factory. In other words, this is a political end. It's an account of political relationships and not simply an account of economics. He's talking about the politics of everyday, the, of, of everyday life in capitalist society. Now, for all the liberal thinkers, from Hobbes through to Hegel, through Adam Smith, the social relationships of commodity production and exchange were treated as natural. It is natural, that, says Adam Smith, that people should bargain with each other exchange one thing with another, <coughs> bargain over the, over, the, over the exchange. In the state of nature, all humans are assumed to be enemies. In the state of nature, all humans are assumed to be competitors and to be, as it were, antagonistic individuals. But for Marx, that's not a state of nature. That's a, state of, that's a condition of society which has a history. It grew up. It was not always the case that human beings treated each other in this way. It will not always be the way that human beings will treat each other. It's a historical phase. The market itself and its principles are not natural and eternal. They are, for Marx, a product of history. If we're going to understand them, we need to understand them as historical products, and we need to understand how they're generated, how they're reproduced, and so on. Private property and exchange rests on also on a conception of people having rights. That's a legal notion, a political notion. And these have to be enforced. If there are to be rights, they have to be enforced. They don't just exist, they have to be enforced and defended. Because they contradict need. I need, um, I need, a, I need to get a dinner tonight, but I haven't got any money. So there are two possibilities. One is, I won't get any dinner, the other is that I'll run into McDonald's, grab my hamburger, and run out without paying. Okay? Uh, both of them, that's called theft. But it is a perfectly possible economic relationship. Uh, but stopping it, there's a contradiction between need and right. Running through the whole of capitalist exchange. We need, human beings need each other. How do we come to be set against each other? If you want to know, if you want to just think how we need each other, just imagine your day if nobody else helped you, if nobody 
if you didn't build your own, if you had to build your own bed, make your own sheets, make the carpet or the, the, the floorboards you stepped out of onto, if you had to build that house, if you had to get that water into those taps, uh, make those taps, get that food, you know, go on and on. How much we actually depend in just the everyday sense on the inputs of others. We are an interdependent species, but at the same time, the social relations which we have set us apart from each other. How are these separations between human beings maintained? That's a central question of politics and law. Now, most, mostly people immediately answer that question, as liberal theory does, by saying, well, they develop states. But that's only one theoretical possibility. There is another one which Marx touches on very briefly and which I think needs to be developed a bit for its uh, potential. And that is the possibility which he calls club law or self-defense or the principle that might is right. If you think about it, which is more effective in protecting your property in uh, Slovenia? Is it the police or the fact that you've got a lock on your door? Probably the lock is more effective than the police. Um, <clears throat> how many people are involved in, uh, employed as police people in modern Western economies? Certain number. How many people are involved, employed as private security guards in a modern Western economy? A lot more. The population of private security guards is much larger than the, 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 the state. We use locks and fences and security systems and so on to guard our property and means of defense. And these are actually rather important uh, in, in, in the functioning of capitalist society. They're a necessary unproductive cost which is added to the whole of uh, every, every commodity. Now it might seem a very trivial point that, until we come a little later in what I want to say to the question of the relationship between states, where club law is suddenly a terribly important principle in the shape of armed forces uh, and, 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 and so on. The central feature of capitalist politics which is missing from an account of the state is all of a sudden opened up as soon as we ask, why are there many states? And what are the relationships between them? I want to return to that. Anyway, the point, uh, general point, is that the force, if you like, that holds capitalist property relations together is more complex than simply the state. There are other things also that play that role. Now, in any case, we have to ask some other questions about states if we want to develop a theory of states. And one of the things that does mark states, both before capitalism and most definitely within capitalism, is that if you think about them as economic actors, then they do not depend entirely on exchange. Every state is marked, and has been ever since the beginning of the state in ancient Mesopotamia, and certainly through to the Slovenian state or the German state or the American state or the Russian state or any other state you can think of, that is marked by the fact that states collect tribute. They call it taxes. Okay, but death and taxes are the two things that go together. <coughs> it's inescapable. They collect tribute from those they govern. Okay, tax is really important, actually, in understanding the whole dynamics of, uh, the, the, uh, of any modern economy. Fiscal policy, as they call it. Now, if you look at, in Marx's Capital, you will find no systematic discussion of tax. It's missing from his economic account. Now, in Volume 3 of Capital, he discusses the different ways in which surplus value is divided up amongst the various claimants to it. The industrial capitalists, the commercial capitalists, the bankers and financiers, and the landed, and the landed classes who collect rent. So it takes the form of profit, profit on industry, profit on commerce, where am I, where am I going? Interest on money and rent. They're all forms of surplus value. But there is another one, tax, which is the state putting its mitt in to the pool, as it were, and saying, I'm having that, 
for my purposes, to pay for the armies, to pay for whatever else it's going to do. That's missing entirely from capital. Not a discussion of it at all. I mean, it's not that Marx was unaware of it, but he somehow seems to have postponed that discussion to perhaps the book on the state. But it is necessary to understand the workings of modern capitalism. And it's a big gap. Certainly today, a very large part of the gross domestic product of most states passes through the hands of the state um, in one form or another. The tax powers of the state also, the fact that the state has the power to tax its citizens um, in one way or another and is the basis on which most borrowing by the state is based on the promise that it will pay back in the future. And it can always make that promise because it has this power of taxation. And that goes right back to the end of the 17th century in Britain when the modern capitalist state system of taxes and bank, and the Bank of England and the tax system and the imperial system were all tied together in, in what Marx called for the first time in a this, in this single system. And that's got consequences for all modern capitalist states. Of course, the question of borrowing raises then the question of state debts. Because states are debtors quite on I can go, I can't default on my debt if I have one. I just have to pay. States can default. We'll see, interestingly, any day now, whether one of them is going to and what will happen. It is, uh, it's possible for states to default on debt in a way that it is not possible for other economic actors to do. They've done so historically very often in the past. They might do so again, <coughs> with all sorts of consequences. <coughs> I want to end with two... How am I doing? Yes, I think I've just time to finish with two other issues, which yes. seem to me... Sent, if, we were to, if Marx were going to write a book on the state, two other issues he'd have to take up. The first one is the state's intervention into everyday processes of production and reproduction. The whole issue of, if you like, social welfare in the largest possible sense that you can imagine. The, in, the poor laws, even if you stayed with the 19th century in Britain, for example, this is the, that's the century in which the poor laws were re re rewritten. It's the century in which the education system was reformed to ensure that all, ch all children got some schooling paid for by the state, in which the beginnings of public health systems are introduced. Right at the end of the century, the beginning of the 20th century, pensions are introduced, and unemployment insurance is introduced in England. You can go on and on. The state comes to intervene more and more and more. The capitalist state intervenes in entirely novel ways in the processes of reproduction of everyday life, as it were. Now, Marx began to explore that in a brilliant chapter he wrote on chapter 10, volume 1 of Capital, on the working day, when he talked about the development of the factory acts in Britain. Again, against the back of an increasingly insurgent working class movement, he describes how the state was reluctantly push into eventually conceding that it must set some limits to the greed of capital. The werewolf hunger, as he puts it, of hunger, of capital for surplus value. It had to say, you can't keep working, everybody, the longer and longer hours you're demanding. There has to be a limit set, and it will have to be set by the state. We will have to intervene and stop you First of all, employing children at a certain age, then putting limits on the number of hours that women could work, and eventually putting limits on the number of hours that men could work in factories. It was a 50-year struggle in, in England. And similar struggles were to happen in country after country. Uh, they're still happening, of course, today. I mean, you look at what is happening, the, the disgrace of the building of the, uh, football, tournament, the football stadiums in Qatar, where Workers are dying like flies because of the lack of safety and so on, and the lack of attention to their welfare. <coughs> That's the kind of thing that Marx was talking about in the 19th century in England. States can, under appropriate circumstances, be clear about the implications of this, they can be forced to reform. 
to reform society, to intervene. But there are limits to this. Now, interestingly, in Capital, Marx doesn't discuss these limits to the possibilities of reform. He praises the factory inspectors to the skies. The best friend that the workers ever had, he says about one of them. Um, he doesn't, but he doesn't mention he was appointed, not elected. He was appointed as a bureaucrat. He, was, he happens to have been a bloody good bureaucrat. He really did go around prosecuting employers for breaking the law. But uh, nonetheless, he was an appointed civil servant. He wasn't elected. He, in, in terms of Marx's original critique of the bureaucracy, he was a member of the bureaucracy. Marx doesn't actually pursue that question. But we, what we see in the history of the second half of the 19th century, in particular in the 20th century and into the 21st century, is the growth of state wealth <coughs> accompanied by an enormous expansion of, of bureaucracy. State bureaucracy, state administration, state administrative controls of every kind, of the, and all sorts of new rules and regulations uh, which are better dissected, to be honest, not by Marxists today, but by a writer like uh, Foucault. Foucault's account of, of the disciplines um, in, in the book, whose name I can't remember, something with punishment in its title, somebody can tell. Discipline and punishment. Fact, hmm? no, discipline and punishment. Discipline and punishment. Wonderful book. It seems to me completely compatible with the development of the Marxist theory of, of, of the state. But what he's exploring, of course, is a whole, just as Marx didn't discuss tax, the whole set of administrative regulations and interventions in society which are involved in the expansion of state activity. The whole effect of which, of course, is to contain welfare development and so on, state development within the constraints of capital accumulation. That's what Foucault doesn't explore. But that doesn't matter. It's still, I mean, his work is still brilliant and to be added to our, our, our reading list, I think. Now, this, is, this question about state intervention and state reform is really important, I think, for Marxist politics because it may, state intervention becomes a focus for the class struggle. It is a, re a reformable state, a state which is capable of being sufficiently pressured, sometimes to introduce improvements in people's lives. It gets more and more hard under neoliberalism. It's still not impossible. It provides a material basis for reformism, reformism in popular movements. It's always the belief that the state could, if enough, forces could be assembled, change some things for the better. It remains an, always an open possibility in the history of the modern capitalist state. In Gramsci's terms, this is a new kind of state, what he calls an integral state. And I think it's worth exploring Gramsci's ideas about the integral state, which he wrote about in the prison notebooks, in partly in this light. I'm not sure that Gramsci himself takes it where I would like to take it, but it seems to me, the point is that the state is open to alteration. The state is open to assimilation, in part, of impulses. It can assimilate some impulses from below, at the same time that it seeks to control them and shake those impulses. And that, of course, is partly what Miliband and Polanski were talking about, the place where we started, that the state is, is a condensator, as, as Polanski has put it, of class relations. For movements, there's always the hope that there can be improvement. That underlies the whole of reformist politics. <coughs> Leaves a quite narrow space for revolutionary politics. It narrows the space for revolutionary politics, although, uh, and sets up strategic problems for revolutionary politics. The very last thing, and I've just got time to say this in the hour I was allotted, is to return to something which I already mentioned. And that is, lastly, that Marx, if he wanted to write a book on the state, ought really to have retitled it. Not as a book on the state, because there's no such thing as the state. There is a system of states under capitalism. Slovenian, the Slovenian state is one of them, but there are a hundred and something others, um, all alongside, around, 
um, and, and uh, affect all of them interacting in, at some remove with the Slovenian state. The relations, it's not simply that there are many states, but of course they have relationships with each other which are hardly theorized within Marxism. Now, I say hardly because there has been the beginning of this exploration of this question of the multi-state character of capitalism, particularly in the, amongst the most radical thinkers in the field of international relations. I, 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 I don't know what literature is known here, but in Britain, and uh, to some extent elsewhere, I know certainly in Britain, uh, the 2000s saw a flourishing of debate in a number of journals about beginning to answer this question about the multi-state character of capitalism. So the denial of the fact that there's something called the state, but actually many states. Now I just find it interesting that Marx, when he read the critique, when he wrote his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, he missed something in Hegel. Or maybe the manuscript we have is not complete. But there is a passage in, in Hegel in which he does discuss the question of many states. And having said, presented a whole argument that the state is the epitome of reason and rationality in society, he then comes to the relationships between states. And at that point he just says, the relationships between states conform to the state of nature. In other words, they are the relationships of competition and struggle, the war of all against war, of all, the, the law of the jungle. Those, that's essentially what he's saying about there's no There's no overarching state that governs the behavior of states. You can't explain the behavior of states in terms of the theory of the state, because the states compete with each other. They are at war with each other, and so on. And, Mark, and this is rather interesting, because, of course, the whole defense of the state as an instrument of human reason rather collapses in the face of the fact that immediately you say, well, which state exactly? The state in Slovenia? Is that the instrument of reason for the people of China? Um, what is the state that can solve the climate change question? Okay? Because that's a universal, that requires a universal answer. And no state can provide us with the answer to that question. So there are questions in politics about world poverty, about the, the future of the world economy in the largest sense and so on, for which the state, the state system we have is totally unsuited for even beginning to answer it. I just offer that as a sad observation really, but, um, but here we have a world of power relations, <laughs> of club law. Here we have a world of, which is of competition between states which is interrelated with, in all sorts of complicated ways, the competition in world markets, the market competition between capitalist power, capitalist companies and so on. The competitive matching, it's a world in which states feel the necessity to competitively match what they can shoot at each other with what other people are assumed to have. So the whole world of espionage and nuclear submarines in in, off the coast of, of Britain, and so on and so on and so on. The question of how to theorize that multi-state system was begun in the early years of the 20th century, but then rather dropped by Marxism. It was begun by writers like, particularly Bukharin, in his book, The Imperialism and World Economy, and also by Trotsky, with his theory of the combined and uneven development of world economy. Uh, but it's not a theme that's been picked up. It desperately needs to be picked up and developed if Marxism as a theory of states is to have any, any future. But it, that requires that we enlarge the theory of competition to include not simply economic competition of the kind that economists talk about, but also military competition of the kind that existed, for example, between the United States and the USSR in the Cold War. That's not explicable in terms of the models of economic competition we have. But it, was, it had profound effects on all the players in that appalling game. If we want to understand imperialism, if we want to understand war, we need to expand our notion of competition. They are central features of capitalist politics, obviously. And so it throws a, a doubt. There's always an assumption in Miliband and Polanski and 101 other writers about Marxism and the state, 
that. There's always an assumption there's a term over here called the state and another one over here called capital, and they're not, they're, they're separate from each other. And the question is only what's the relationship between them. But actually, sometimes states can act like capitals, and sometimes capitals can act like states. They're not so separate as concepts. So, to end, where do, we, where do you end a talk like that? Well, I'll end by rewriting the final sentences of the Communist Manifesto. The working people have no states. They have a world to win, and they better hurry up, because capitalism is going to destroy through climate change. Thank you. <laughs>
which was catching up with and overtaking the West. That was the, the target that the Stalin had <coughs> set for. Okay, well, that's all right. Everybody understands that. But why call it capitalism? What exactly does catch up and overtake mean? It means subordinate the development of your economy to competition with the West. That's what it meant. But this time, not in terms of market competition, but in terms of military competition. We must catch up with and overtake the West because otherwise, he said, they will destroy us. And if you wanted a proof of that possibility, it was the Nazi invasion in 1941 of Russia. And of course, a war, in a war that Russia very nearly lost. I mean, in the end, Russia beat, Stalin beat Hitler because he was able to develop a big enough productive machine behind the Urals to, fund, to keep pouring troops at the Germans and beating them back. But it was a question of two rival machi economic machines pounding at each other in the most terrible and grotesque and brutal war. <coughs> but the question was, was this anything to do with capitalism? I came to the conclusion you needed to rethink what capitalism was. So that, in a sense, the Second World War was, for me, uh, the, the thing that provoked the, some of these questions. Um, that whether, in fact, we needed to rethink what we meant by capitalism, in a sense, in part, to understand that question, which dominates the centre of, of, of the middle of the, nine, of the 20th century, and of course the, the period after the war, when I was growing up, a uh, period that now seems very distant, the period of the Cold War, and so on. Nonetheless, the same kinds of pressures and interests, and con conflict of interest between states, still exist and still dominate world politics. And so, I suppose, that's the framework in which I'm not answering the question, but I'm at least trying to indicate the framework of things that seem urgent to me to, 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 to approach. Does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if there are any other questions or um, comments, we can continue. Otherwise, we will end with the lecture. Uh, back to uh, Miliband and uh, Kulantzas. Right. Actually, this might be a bit of an unusual question, but w w why has this debate uh, become so influential in the first place? Um, allow me to uh, provide a couple of uh, reasons why I uh, asked this. I mean, it was more of a caricature of a debate than a real one. They weren't really uh, assaulting the predispositions of the, the other they were more just reaffirming their own uh, position, and that, that's it. I mean, as a debate in itself, it's rather intellectually non-stimulating and not that interesting, to be frank. Uh, now, that, this may be a personal opinion, but um, I mean, this was a time when I, I imagine there were a lot of such debates. There were a lot of political actors. There were, the, the theoretical question about the essence of the state and the political agenda of changing it, taking power or otherwise, was very much active in the 70s and there around. So basically the question is, why particularly uh, this debate? Before calling answers, uh, I think that the answer is uh, less than satisfactory. I asked him to uh, talk about uh, the debate between Polanzas and Miliband. So uh, I don't know if uh, Colin can say more on this why he decided to, if I understood you correctly, why he decided to talk about Polanzas and Miliband. No, 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 sorry. The question was why um, historically it became such an important reference point. So why, why this? I mean, it's quite difficult to, to I mean, I agree, I agree with your question. So, which is almost to say, you know, I don't know that you asked me a question, but whether we don't just agree. Um, I don't think it was a particularly interesting debate either. It was uh, very convoluted. Um, and neither of them really drew out of the other what the principles of what they were saying were. So Poulancis, for example, said, well, Miliband hasn't got a theoretical problematic, rather than exploring carefully what, what, what the theory that Miliband was using was which would be much more useful, I think. Um, Miliband accused uh, Poulancis of what he called theoretical abstractionism, 
which was another way of saying, I don't really know what you're talking about. Um, and th there is a, there's a quite entertaining, though again very difficult, uh, essay by Ernesto Leclerc, where he reviews the Miliband Kulansis debate. He was written in the early 70s. And he actually makes some sense of, of what he calls the theoretical abstractionism of the charge of theoretical abstractionism that Miliband makes against Kulansis. And he largely shows that Miliband, that Kulansis's concepts are inco incoherent in their, in their inner structure, as it were. It's quite, it's quite useful as a sort of demolition job. Um, why was it so prominent? It's like asking why was New Left Review so prominent as a, as a discussion journal of the left internationally? The answer is, well, it came early. It already had an established readership. If you wanted to be up with what was going on, the editors of New Left Review decided for you what these significant debates were. So they never had anything about the German state debate, for example. They weren't interested in translating any of the... Uh, the stuff that was being written in Germany. So that didn't reach the attention of a lot of the world's left, although actually it was, I think, a lot more interesting. So in the end, you have to blame Perry Anderson probably, um, because Nikos Poulantzis was in Paris, and Paris is where it really matters. You know, something coming out of Paris is much more interesting than something coming out of Frankfurt. Um, that was, so there was a kind of intellectual snobbery about it as well, I think. Um, you know, this is really to personalise things and trivialise them, but they have their, those sorts of explanations have their place, I think, in, in intellectual history. But, but I, you can't ignore the role of the New Left Review as a journal in terms of the way that it itself set that debate up as being important for intellectuals to follow. Uh, is that, I don't know if that answers your question, but you can sort of... Keep quiet if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't. <laughs>